Hey people, today we're going to talk about display flags, template flags and lock flags inside of Houdini. It may affect your workflow in a big way and if you do it correctly, it may positively impact your workflow, make it easy for you to see what you need to see at any one time inside your viewport. But let's go in and take a look at this setup that's going to walk you through the chain. You have a box, I remesh it, give it triangulated faces using the attribute noise, color it with random colors by a certain criteria using an expression. I delete if the red component value is more or equals to 0.6. Next, I'm boolean it with a sphere placed where it kind of cuts a cube halfway. So the first thing that you've already seen me do is that blue flag that view at any stage the state of the geometry. So there are a few hotkeys that I always use. It's part of the QWERT. Uh, if you select the node and hit Q, you disable that node. That's a toggle. The other one is R. And uh, E, set a node on template. We've seen the view flag. Now I want to talk about the template flags, this bottom right one. Okay, when you template things, you can see a wireframe representation of that geometry from another part of your network. For example, I want to decide where to cut the sphere. I probably want to view the sphere set boolean to template. So you can see the result and at the same time I can select this sphere and adjust. I can also put my pointer over the viewport and click enter to interactively adjust the position. Hit W key to toggle between my shaded and my wireframe. Uh, I may even want to template the box. If I also want to see the result of the delete, I can also do a template with a shift key. So that shows me the original box where I see the six-sided faces and at the stage where I've already remeshed them, applied the noise and deleted the faces according to that noise. We know that we can do a template with a shift to add or remove. There's another thing that this template can do while we're looking at this stage, right? It's kind of fully shaded. Templates are always appearing wireframe. But what you can do is when you mouse over this template, instead of hitting just shift and click, do shift control and click. You can see that the template changes color for darker magenta. That puts it as a template, but also sets it to be shaded mode. All of that's to help us visualize stuff. The next thing, I want to introduce you to the render flag. In a, in a normal way, when you hit the display flag, there's this blue ring and a purple ring in the middle. But actually, it's two flags in one. If I mouse over this, you'll see the help tooltip says display slash render. So that purple paw is the render flag. So if I hit this, I'm going to go ahead and render gives a render view of this current scene. If I control click on this display, it's rendering nothing. Under normal circumstances, uh, whatever you, you're looking at is whatever you're rendering. That's because that purple color core by default is following along your view stage. If I control click, we decoupled that purple core and that thing is going to be whatever's going to render. A lot of times in a very complicated network, you forget to put it back to the actual node that you're going to render and that messes up. Sometimes you forget and that was your last view node and then you go out and then you render and realize that it's not what you actually want to be rendering. So a lot of people will put a, kind of a render node and then uh, connect that to the actual thing that you want to render to put it aside and control click that and that gives you kind of as long as you don't mess with it and don't touch it uh, you can you're free to view and edit your node your graph and network at whichever state you want without disruptively causing disruption to that actual state that you want to render it can work for you or against you so if you forget Sometimes you cut that connection and somehow it's broken and you render, you get nothing. So that's something to take care of. The last thing that I want to show you is this bottom left. Technically, the name for this flag is called the log flag. Documentation tells you that it freezes a node's output. So it remembers the state of the geometry and it will stop evaluating whatever came before. So to illustrate that point, I've brought up a scene that I'm currently working on in collaboration with my good friend Kin Hong. This is artistically modeled by, by him. Okay, so a big shout out to you, Kin Hong, and thank you for providing this asset uh, that we're working on. Just to quickly step through, my intention was to kind of create a, a body of water, right? kind of a waterfall, and uh, I want to start the sim with a box that is already filled with uh, flip particles. So. In order to get that, I have what I have. I'm going to put the template, put 
should be the other way. Okay, so I'll, I'll look at my simplified geometry. It's kind of a boxed up thing that's going to be filled with water, but I want to put the, the template on this guy. So you see that I want to use whatever uh, is already there as a kind of a river bed, right? Uh, so the river bed is not flat. So I'm going to use that and pull the in away and cut the bounding geometry, right? So uh, so that's how I'm using that to kind of determine where the water level is when I create my boxes. And you see a tube here, that's because I'm using a tube. So I can do a shift click on my template to show you where the tube is located. So I, I get to see two things, right? My boxes and the thing that's going to cut the box to get the river bed. Show you the boolean and I'm quickly just to visualize it kind of remesh so that's that was what I was trying to do so further on I group a bottom part of the river bed and I'm going to kind of give them a different set of rules for when I create uh, the initial velocity for my flip the top I'm going to give them a fixed velocity that points downwards controls the running water downwards but the, the bottom I kind of want to be able to let the water flow along the flow of topology so uh, I kind of group them as bottom and top and in the split kind of bottom points so here I get my remesh on the top points and then here are my bottom points so then I'm processing them separately so here you see no velocity but over here uh, I'll start to see some velocities so if I do an add take away the delete the geometry but keep the points I'll be able to see these points and you'll see them kind of um, besides doing that I'm also kind of adding a, a kind of an upward thing okay if I if I hide that you'll see these points are kind of running across uh, along hopefully right along the curvature of the the bed okay and so over here I've added kind of a a, l a little bit of upward component to that so um, so that adds it to here the next thing I was going to do if I kind of put my add here right again they have no velocity and next I was is a simple zero zero one take a look at that you'll see that all of them are kind of parallel and pointing towards the positive Z okay so they kind of a bit boring right so I'm adding a, an attribute noise to break the monotony so this attribute noise you see kind of um, interesting shapes of the velocity right and finally that here comes the thing that I was going to show you because of the processes that came before it's going to be a bit painful I just need to let you know that this noise is animated right so it it's gonna be kind of left and right uh, and offsetting in all three axes so I'm gonna play that okay and you can see how long it's taking for each frame right to cook and evaluate Okay, so that's about the speed that we're dealing with. I'm gonna hit escape and rewind back to our first frame. Now what I'm gonna do, uh, I've already got an ad here. So now what I'm gonna do is kind of before it enters this uh, noise where it kind of does this noise thing, all those processing that came before up right up to this stage where I've set the initial velocity, I, I can kind of freeze it and say that okay that geometry and all that's gonna stay this way and that's not going to animate and then I leave this to be interactively updating so I will kind of click on this lock flag okay so what happens to this lock flag now I view through that that's my lock flag uh, and then view through my noise okay so that's that noise is kind of acting on on the points uh, and kind of use a visualizer right to, to help us uh, delete the faces and just look at the noise now I'm gonna play, press play I'm gonna click play 
and look at how fast it's interacting right now. Okay, so I get almost close to real time. Oh. Or even faster. Okay, so you must remember to click on this guy, and that gives you um, kind of locked to and capped at the performance at real time. So now I get a good idea of how that's going to the flow is going to be redirected for more interesting flow of the water direction. So you see how useful that is. So it stops all the processing that came before stops it at that stage. So it, at this stage, if I now disconnect this link, I'm sorry, if I disconnect at this link, right, so kind of can, it can be considered standalone. So if I rewind and play, it's still going to give me this state of the geometry. Okay, so what will happen when this is in force and it's locked? It cooks faster and uses less memory because it doesn't have to cook it every time it needs it, right? So the more complex the nodes that came before it, the more benefit you reap. And the frozen output is saved with a hip file. Okay, so now I'm um, going to show you that hip file is kind of 5.879 uh, megabytes on save. I'm going to save it uh, with a... Uh, so 5001, so 5.02. Save it. And you'll see um, it's kind of a bit larger. And uh, if I don't freeze it and I save it again, you'll see that file go back to around 5.8 megabytes. So um, you can freeze multiple nodes if you don't need to animate the source and uh, freezing it, you can make it a standalone file. So if I had an ABC, that Olympic file, you get one of the Olympic files, kind of 1.39 gigabytes. I can, at the Olympic stage where I load my Olympic Right, so that's probably 1.39 gig. At that point, of course, I can do a file cache, right? So the other way is click lock, and that's going to save it, embed it together with our Houdini file, which is a bit of craziness. So you get a hip file that's probably very close to this one gig. There's a drawback and advantage. You can't use this as a cache for animated things. Right? Whatever you freeze at that point is one single frame. It's not good to use it as a cache, but I tend to use it as a Kind of, I load everything in and stop it here during the session. So I evaluate that and before I save my file, I'll unlock it and save it. It's good for your asset if you want to pass the hip file along. In other words, all the things that you need, you can collect it in one place, in one frame. You can pass a hip file to another guy right? and he'll have all the incoming assets. These are flags that you see every day, but if you use it correctly, it will help you achieve a more pleasant workflow. So thank you for watching.